Okay, so last we left off, I believe we were talking about colligative properties. Yes, no, maybe. I heard maybe. Okay. Well, we're going to assume that this is where we're at. Okay. So when we're talking about colligative properties, so colligative properties are the properties that are associated with um, those forces, those intermolecular forces um, interacting in solutions. So uh, we will talk specifically about um, like the covalent type of forces kind of right now, that's kind of general colligative properties. So when we do that, we basically have to take in consideration how many uh, different molecules that we actually have in solution. So we need to sit there and take in consideration the mole fraction, or in some cases, the molality, right? So the number of moles of that solute that we have in solution is gonna play a role on how that the liquid or that solvent is going to respond. So we kind of talked about mole fraction. This is a typo right here. So let me fix this real quick. So when we talk about mole fraction, um, the mole fraction is going to be equal to the particular mole. And then it would be equal to the sum of the moles, all the moles that are in the solution, okay? So let's say for instance, we are talking about um, a solution of, methanol, I'm gonna assume that we have one mole of methanol, and we have two moles of water. Okay, so if we were talking about the solution of methanol and water, first off, who's gonna be the solute and who's gonna be the uh, solvent? The solute would be the solute would, would be methanol. The solute would be methanol. That's correct. Okay. So if we are calculating the mole fraction for the solvent, so we want X solvent. What would that be in this case? So if we're looking at the part over the whole, so the whole solution is the combination of the number of moles of methanol and water over that part. So you just told me that the solvent was water. So don't we have the number of moles of water? Yes, two. Okay, so in that case, it will be two moles over the sum. In this case, we have one mole of methanol plus two moles of water. Okay. And since we have moles over moles, it's gonna be unitless. Okay. So in the case of molality, we're gonna be looking at the moles of solvent over kilograms of solution. I mean, of solvent, sorry, not of solution. Okay, 
So in this case, again, if we had the number of moles of water, we'd have to change that into kilograms, right? And then we'd have our one mole divided by our moles of water. So let's go ahead and do that. So two moles of water. How many kilograms would that be? How would I calculate that? I know, I know it's been like many, many years since you guys had to calculate uh, grams from starting with moles. You would I know you're asking. To get grams, you would have to multiply it by the molecular weight. Okay, so what is the molecular weight of water? Is it like 18? That is correct. So we have 18 grams per one mole. And then to get kilograms, wouldn't you divide that by a thousand? Okay. And I got 0 0.036. Okay, so then when we, calculate the when we calculate the molality, it's going to be zero point zero three six at the bottom. and one mole on top. It's 27.777. Seven. And we use that little m. Sometimes they put a line underneath it to let us know that it's not mass. Okay, now when we talk about the mole fraction, right? So since we know that XA represents the mole fraction of the solute, if I want the mole fraction of the, I mean, sorry, the mole fraction of the solvent, if I want the mole fraction of the solute, how could I calculate that without having to go through this whole process up here again? So if it's a fraction and we have 0 0.667 of it is water, so then what must be the rest? What fraction must be the rest? So would you do three minus the 0 0.667? Would I use three minus or would I use one? Because it's a fraction, right? Right. So since it's a fraction, I just minus by one. So my solute, X solute would be zero point three three. So in the case, there's only two things, it makes it pretty easy. If you have 67% uh, of one, then the other one must be 33, right? Right. So same concept with the fractions.
Okay, are you guys ready to figure out how to use this? Okay, so before we get really knee deep in it, so the thing about this from here on out, a lot of the things that you've learned, you're gonna be applying in very, well, I'm not gonna say complicated ways, but systematically, right? And so you wanna think about it big picture, systematically. Oh, what is a mole? How do I calculate moles? What is a, you know, you've done fractions for everything, right? You've done uh, uh, mole percent, right? And you've done, now you've done mole fractions and you've done mass percent, right? So it's still the same concept. Really, it's that part over the whole, part over the whole. So anytime you're getting any fractions or percents, those are usually dealing with parts over the whole, okay? So let's talk about how we can apply it. Okay, so uh, one way that we can sit there and use this, uh, the mole fraction is for the vapor pressure, right? So since we know that we, in our solution, when we're talking about um, solutes that are, that, that are, are not ionic, then we can actually use, I'm gonna erase this part here. We can actually use that mole fractions to sit there and determine the vapor pressure of a solution. So if we know that the vapor pressure of the solute, I mean of the solvent, then we can calculate the vapor pressure of the solution. So for instance, if I gave you the vapor pressure of water, not of water is equal to 0 0.79 ATM. Okay. And if I'm using this methanol solution, so I can actually calculate the pressure of the solution or of the solution as a whole, right? Or the vapor pressure of that solution. So in this case, I just take my mole fraction that I calculated over here, my 0 0.667, multiply it times that 0 0.79 ATM, So, and I get this quick with the calculator. Are you there? Yeah, it's um, 0.527. Okay, piece of cake. Okay, well, since it is, it, nobody said anything, we're gonna move forward. Any questions, concerns, cash? Okay. Should we like uh, memorize these formulas? Um, they're gonna be provided for you, but you need to be able to recognize them and when you need to use them, so yeah. And so this is Rob's Law. So Rob's Law basically deals with vapor pressure. Do you remember the ones from last week? Any other ones from last week? I mean, I remember doing them. I would have to do some more practice questions before I really got it. Okay. Yeah, so route law deals with vapor pressure. We also have Henry's law that also deals with uh, 
It deals with partial pressures or vapor pressures. Okay, so um, the here's a uh, question for us. The vapor pressure of a solution containing 53.6 grams of glycerin, uh, C3H8O3, dissolved in 133.7 grams of ethanol, C2H5OH, is 113 torr at 40.0 degrees Celsius. Calculate the vapor pressure of pure ethanol at 40 degrees Celsius. So we're calculating P solvent. Okay. So, I mean, the first thing I would do is solve the equation for that, just so it's so in the right form. So we're calculating P solvent? Well, I'm not sure I was asking. So the equation is, uh, it's, P it's P solution. Equals P solvent times the, uh, the mole fraction. Oh, yeah, it would be because um, the glycerin is the solvent. Is glycerin right? a solvent? It says glycerin dissolved in ethanol. That's right. So is glycerin the solvent? No, it would be the solute. Yes, that's right. Glycerin yeah. would be the solute. So always remember the one that's typically lower, um, lower in quantity is the solute. The one that is more abundant is the solvent. Okay. okay. So if we're doing the math here, what would I need to do? So you're right, we're, cap we're calculating P-solvent. So we need to solve for that P-solvent, like you said earlier. Mm -hmm. so you're right. So we just divide both sides by X solvent. Right. That's going to be my abbreviation for solution. OK. OK, so how do we calculate x solvent? So do we have to convert grams to moles for glycerin and ethanol? That is correct. We have to convert grams to moles for glycerin and ethanol. Okay, so let's start with the glycerin. So I have 53.6 grams of glycerin. Okay. So what do I need to do to convert? Um, I'm trying to find the molecular weight of glycerin right now. So it's um, 92 grams per mole, so you would divide by 92. Okay. So 92 grams on the bottom, 
one mole on top. And then that is equal to 0 0.5, what we do, 0 0.583. Okay. And for Ethanol, starting off with 133. Oops. So what am I going to do in this case? Convert it to moles too. Going to convert it to moles as well. Okay. Um, so, what is the molar mass of ethanol? It's 46 grams per mole. Okay, and that equals 2.91. Okay, so if I want to calculate my mole fraction, So it would be the um, moles of solvent, which okay, so would be the ethanol okay. so, divided okay. by the other two numbers added. Okay, let's see. What do you guys get? 0 0.833. Okay, so then our starting pressure is 113 torr divided by 0 0.833. So P solve is going to equal. I got 136. 136? Yeah. Okay. Piece of cake? Yes, no, maybe. 
Um, yeah, I guess. But uh, for all these questions, because I noticed this one specifically says it stays at the same temperature. Will all these questions do that, or do they sometimes change temperature? Uh, sometimes they change temperature, but you have to remember you're working with gases under those circumstances. Right? So you'll, you'll make the adjustment based upon the, the ideal uh, gas law. That's right. Okay. Good question, though. Okay, you ready to move on? Okay, so we've talked about that particular case with colligative properties. Now we get to sit there and use them for other cases as well too. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at the uh, boiling temperature and the uh, freezing temperature or melting temperature, depending on how you look at it. So then in this case, uh, for the boiling temperature elevation, this delta T represents It's the T of the boiling point, the temperature of the boiling point of that pure substance or the solute, I mean solvent, or the solution, the temperature of the solution minus the temperature of the solvent. Okay, and so that's going to give me my, my change in uh, boiling temperature because when we add stuff to, a, uh, to our solvent, it causes the temperature to go up in most cases, right? As long as there's no chemical reaction, the temperature is going to go up. The boiling, I should say, the boiling temperature is going to go up because of those uh, intermolecular forces, okay? So our delta T is gonna be just the difference between that. And so, and that's gonna just equal KB. KB is a constant, it's the boiling point constant or the molal boiling point elevation constant, to be specific, and multiply it by the molality, okay? And so the same thing happens in the case of freezing. So instead of using a boiling point constant, you're using a freezing point constant, okay? And that's the only distinction. But it, here, your delta T is going to be the, the freezing point temperature of the, of the original or the pure substance minus the freezing point temperature of the solution. And that's going to equal your delta T. Okay. Piece of cake. Now, do you want to use it? It's not like what you have a choice. What mean, like in this context? What was that? Molau? What is, yeah, like in this specific context, I don't understand yeah. what Molau boiling point means. So, well, Molau boiling point, so they use Molau. Molal basically is moles of solute over kilograms of solvent. So that's what that is the definition of molal in general. So molality, not molarity. Molality is is that it's moles of solute. Right. Over kilograms. Well, I, I guess my question could be better phrase is what's the difference between molal boiling point and just saying boiling point? Because you could have a boiling point constant in another type of unit as well. And so they're letting you know that it's the molal. Oh, okay. Point. Like this is just specifying the unit. Exactly. Oh, okay. So in this case, in the case of the molal boiling point, it's going to be Celsius over molality. Right. Okay, I see. Okay. 
Okay. Calculate the molecular weight of a compound used in antifreeze for 0 0.243 grams of an unknown solute dissolved in 25.0 milliliters of water with a freezing point of, uh, sorry, freezing point depression of 0 0.201 Celsius. The KF for water is 1.86 degrees Celsius molal, per molal. So what are we gonna do? Are you going to put your solute over your solvent? Okay, so we're going to use that concept of molality. Um, I'm going to draw that with a little line under it to make sure that we don't get it mixed up with mass. And I'm going to write out mass when we need mass. So we know that molality is going to be equal to, I said moles of your solute. over kilograms of solvent okay so first off what is my solute in this case and what is my solvent your solute is an un unknown solution okay which we have the mass for, right? So we have mass of solute. And that equals 0 0.243 grams. Okay. And what is my solvent? The water. The water. Now, my water is in what units? Is it in mass? No, it's in liters or milliliters. It's in liters. Oh, it's in milliliters. Okay, so we have a volume of water. So what do I need to do to, to get that into kilograms? Um, don't you use its density? I use its density. So we're going to make a couple of assumptions. So the density of water is? It's it's like one, but I can't remember what the units are. Anybody want to help her out? One gram per milliliter? Or... One gram per milliliter. Okay. Okay, so we got one gram per milliliter. So if I change that, oops. And I need to change that into kilograms. How do I change that to kilograms? Just divide it by a thousand. Oops. Okay. So we get 
0 0.025. Grams. Of water. I'm sorry, not grams. Kilograms. Yeah, I was gonna say, isn't it supposed to be in kilograms? Yeah, my brain is not working, you know. It's past happy hour, so you know I'm shutting down now. So <laughs> okay. So that gives me my kilograms of that, right? And so we know that the the equation that we're going to be using. What is the equation again? I'm old and see now I can't remember. You gonna help me out? Help an old man out? I'm get across the street. Are you there? I actually missed what the question was. I said, so what is the equation that we're going to be using to calculate? Uh, oh, I did not take a picture of it. I do not know. Delta T um, equals KF times. The molality? That's right. Okay, so delta T equals KF times the molality. Okay, so we're given our KF. KF is equal to 1.86 degrees Celsius. Um, we're also given our delta T, right? So we have uh, the freezing point depression. Okay, now what are we looking for again? The molecular weight. The molecular weight. Okay. So we know we calculate the number of moles. We use the for number of moles. That's going to equal how do I calculate the number of moles? Typically. From or molality? No, just the number of moles in general. I mean, it's Avogadro's number. Is it Avogadro's number? I guess you can use Avogadro's number to calculate the number of moles. But if I'm typically given mass or something, right? Because how would I calculate the, the number of moles? And it would just be the molecular weight Okay. Of the compound per one mole. Okay. So that's what we're looking for. And I'm going to use, I'm going to write mass so that we don't mistake the molality. So mass of my unknown, right? Oh, Do yeah. I, I just mass? did not remember this at all, to be honest with you. <laughs> it's been a while. I see that, huh? So should I start calling you grandma? Okay, so we have the mass. I should say mass of us. Okay, so we can plug this in for the number of moles of our solute here for our molality. So then we can get delta T. I mean, equals KF okay. 
mass of solute divided by kilograms of solvent times the molecular weight So then I can solve for the molecular weight by multiplying both sides by molecular weight and dividing both sides by the change in temperature. Oh my gosh, this is such a complicated problem. <laughs> I, I'm not prepared for this. Just, it's not complicated, it's just a couple of steps. Okay, so then we plug in our numbers. And W is going to equal 1.86. Degrees Celsius molal times mass of our our unknown, which is zero point two four three grams divided by our water in kilograms times delta T. So and this is going to give me grams per mole. Okay. So like on the test, for example, we would know that we're using this equation for this problem because it has Kf, right? That's right. And then also you're talking about freezing point depression. That's the biggest key. Okay, freezing point depression means okay. the delta T equation. Yep. Okay. Okay. So what do you guys get when you plug it in? All my calculators, batteries are dead, and my phone is dead. So I need somebody who's quick at the gun. Um, that second number is zero point on the top is zero point two four three, right? Yeah. Okay, so it is um eighteen point one. Okay, piece of cake. Yes, no, maybe? Kind of, just seems like a lot of steps. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just a lot of different things that I don't really, like I'm just not as comfortable with as I used to be. Uh, you gotta brush off those cobwebs. Yeah. Okay. Okay, ready to move forward? Move on. Okay. 
Okay, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is osmotic pressure, okay? So osmotic pressure is, uh, is the pressure that is gonna be occurring as a result of a semi-permeable membrane. Um, so when we go through osmosis, um, you have, let's say the concentration of a, of a solution on one side compared to the concentration of the solution on the other side. So your fluid, usually water, is gonna diffuse to sit there and try to balance out those concentrations so that they'll equal a equilibrium, okay? So that they'll be equal on both sides. So if we're talking about a cell, so in the case of a cell, if the concentration of our solute is greater on the outside than it is on the inside, that's considered to be hypertonic, hyper meaning more, okay? So then the water inside of the cell is gonna rush out and it's gonna go out into the solution. So let's say for instance, you eat a lot of salt, right? What happens to your blood? The pressure raises? That's right, your blood pressure raises. So typically, if you've eaten a whole bunch of salt, your blood pressure is gonna start shooting up, especially if you have, you're prone to that, right? And you're not drinking enough fluids. So then in that case, what's happening is that the water that's inside that cell is being shot out into, the, into your bloodstream to sit there and try to balance it out. And that's causing pressure on the cell membrane, okay? So it's the pressure result of that movement, the fluid, okay? So if I have a cell and the concentration on the inside of the cell is greater than that concentration on the outside of the cell, what's gonna happen? I mean, I don't know anything about biology, but does the cell like burst? Yes. So in that case, the fluid is starting going to flow in. So then that cell is going to get bigger. And then if it gets too big, then it's going to burst. Okay. Questions, concerns, cash? Okay. So in that context, that's considered a hypotonic, right? because the outside concentration is less than the inside concentration, right? And so you get that flow in, okay? So if the concentrations are even, it's called isotonic. Okay, so, oops, turned away. So to calculate the osmotic pressure, we're gonna be using this equation, pi equals MRT, where M represents the molarity. Oh, wait, so. Yeah, so in the case of, uh, of that movement, the osmotic movement, um, the pressure could go up if it's going in either direction, but particularly if you're looking at reference to the cell, by it's going in, pressure is going to go up, right? By it's flowing out, you're going to have less pressure involved in that because the, the cell is going to kind of deflate in that sense. Okay. So um, good question, Alberto. Um, so in this case, we get pi equals capital MRT. Capital M stands for molarity, not molality. Molarity, which is moles over volume. And then R is the ideal gas constant, and then T is temperature. So if we think about this, and pi is osmotic pressure. So basically, you guys remember this, EV equals NRT. If we bring that V over, we get P equals N over V, which is molarity, capital M, 
equals n over v rt. So it's just the same equation where instead of using p, we use pi. So why'd you give us all these new letters? Had to make it more complicated. Oh yeah, you know, that's my job. <laughs> it's like, we gotta use every alphabet known out there. Yeah. Okay. That's how it is in math too. They have the yeah. same exact formula written with three different constants or something. Yeah, yeah. And you start running out of letters, you're like, man, so like that's like mass, you know? We use mol molality. And then you use the little m for mass as well, too. Well, you can't do that when you're talking about this. So. Yeah, you got to start using whole new alphabets. Exactly, yeah. So we, we've already extended the whole Greek alphabet. So we're running out of those letters. So I'm like, we need to start using the Chinese alphabet to add on to it. So. <laughs> okay, so here's a question. A 10.0 gram sample of a liver enzyme Catalase has a volume of 1.00 liters at 27.0 degrees Celsius. The osmotic pressure at 27.0 degrees Celsius is 0.74 torrs. Calculate the molar mass of the catalase enzyme. So how would I do that? Let me give you a hint. So we know moles is equal to mass divided by molecular weight, which is also the molar mass. Okay. So then how would I do that? Oh, well, I would start. I mean, I guess you don't have to, but I would start by solving the um, PV equals NRT or okay. pi, whatever it is, for N. Okay, so I'd go N. So you said solve it for N, huh? Mm -hmm. so I have NV RT. So first you would uh, divide both sides by RT and then multiply both sides by V. Okay, <clears throat> so cancels, cancels. So I get N equals V pi RT. So then what am I gonna do next? We know that N is equal to mass over molecular weight. So if I want to solve for my molecular weight, what do I need to do? Anybody there? Yeah, I'm just thinking. I mean, we have the osmotic pressure mm -hmm. and we have R and T. So we would just have to solve for the volume. So why would we solve for the volume? Volume is given to us. Oh, wait, so we don't have to, we already have everything then? We would just plug it all in? 
yeah, all you need to do is solve for your molecular weight, right? So you oh, want you know, I'm just overthinking it then. I'm trying to figure out what we need to find out. So we want to multiply both sides by MW to get molecular weight by itself. And so then you're going to get mass divided by N. Well, divided by, because we're replacing N because we said right. N is divided equal. by, yeah, that whole thing. Okay, so then we'll have molecular weight is going to equal. So our mass is uh, that would be the ten grams, right? Okay. Okay, RT. So we have it in Celsius. We know that it has to be in Kelvin. So how do we change Celsius into Kelvin? We just add 273. Okay. Which equals 300 Kelvin. Okay, so we have an R is 0 0.0821. That's ATM liters over moles Kelvin and times 300 Kelvin. Divided by our volume, which is one liter. And we're given our pressure. It's in tours. It needs to be in what units? ATM. Okay, so how do I change tours into ATM? Anybody remember? Honestly, I do not. Yeah, I got no idea. So 760 tours equals one ATM. Tours are going to cancel out. Somebody who's quick on the gun. Um, yeah, 9.34 times 10 to the negative fourth. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry, 7.4, I misspoke, 9.74. Okay. Times 10 to the negative fourth. Okay, so then we'll put that at the bottom here. Okay, so what did you guys get? If you plug it in, ATM. I converted it in scientific notation myself, so this might be wrong, but 2.53 times 10 to the fifth? Yep, 2.53 okay. times 10 to the fifth. Yeah, so it's a, an enzyme. Enzymes are gonna be pretty high in mass, so they're typically in the hundred thousands when we okay. talk about mass. And that's grams per mole. I wasn't sure if I just did the calculator wrong again. You know how I'm kind of notorious for that. Yeah. Yes, I do know. <laughs> okay. 
Okay, questions, concerns, cash, credit, Kool-Aid. Okay, good. Ready to move on? Okay. I mean, if we have to. Yes. Okay. So when we're talking about the electro the electrolytes, so electrolytes are are those ions when they dissociate, right? So we have to start taking those into consideration because they're going to have a stronger effect than let's say your your uh, covalently bonded things, right? When they're added to solutions because of those charges. So when we do that, we take into consideration the number of particles that are going to be in that solution, right? So if I have say calcium chloride. What is the chemical formula for calcium chloride? Um, CaCl2. Okay. So in this case, I have, when it dissociates, how many different particles would I have? How many C pluses, Ca2 uh, plus will I have? And how many chlorine ions will I have? You would have three total, one calcium and two chlorine. Okay, so I'd have, I would have three totals. So I'd have my calcium ion and then I'd have two Cl minus ions, right? Okay, so all together that's three. So when we talk about I, I is stands for uh, Van Hoff's, uh, factor. And so it's just the number of dissociated particles. So in this case, I is going to be equal to three. Okay. So, so the difference between electrolytes or ionic compounds are, or ionic solutions is the fact that you're taking into consideration all three um, ions are going to have an effect on that, on that temperature. Right. So then our our uh, boiling temperature elevation delta T is going to be equal to I KB molality. The boiling pressure. Um, I mean, sorry, the freezing. Uh, sorry, not freezing pressure. The freezing point um, depression is going to be equal to. Uh, I KF uh, molality. Okay. And so for osmotic pressure, it's going to be exactly the same thing. Okay, questions? So yes, no, a question like this would be just like the last example, but we would just multiply on like however many particles there are. That's correct. Yeah. So it's exactly the same thing. Now you're just at, keeping in track of the number of particles. And does it, it, it'll like explicitly say when we should use the I factor and when we shouldn't? No, you, you know that if it's an ionic solution, you need to use it, right? So anytime that you have an ionic compound that's going to be put in water, then you're going to use it. If oh, it's not okay. an ionic compound, if it's a covalent compound, because methanol is a covalent compound, right? Right. Yeah. And so then in that case, you're not going to use I. Okay. Because they're not dissociating. So anytime that you have stuff that's dissociating, you know, breaking up into their ionic compounds, then you're going to use the I. So I like to use that I for ionic. Right, it lets me know. Okay, mm -hmm. I am. You know. Okay, let's see this goes. Calculate the freezing point uh, for a solution of zero point seven two four grams of calcium chloride solution in uh, seventeen. I mean, one hundred and seventy-five grams of water with a KF of one point eight six degrees uh, 
per molality. So what am I gonna do in this situation? Are you here? Are you there? Yeah, so um, you use the delta T I K F mole solute one, but I would just write it like fully extended. So instead of, um, or sorry, not moles, molality, I would just write it as the uh, mole solute over kilogram solvents. Okay. over kg solvent. Okay, so what am I given? Well, the KF. Okay, so I have my KF. KF is equal to 1.86. Degree C, molality, or molality. Okay, and then, anything else? Um, I mean, you're basically giving kilogram solvent. You just have to convert 175 grams to kilograms. Okay, so I have kg solvent. So it'd be 0.175? Yep. Equals 175 grams. Divided by a thousand, is one kilogram equals zero point one seven five. Okay. Anything else I'm given? Um, we could get the mole solute by converting calcium chloride to moles using its molecular weight. Okay, I can get the mole solute. Okay, so what is the molar mass of calcium chloride? 0.1. Four grams of calcium chloride okay calcium weighs how much um 40 grams per mole Grams. And then chloride, we have two of them. If I remember correctly, it's like 35.45, something like that. So times two. So that's 71 ish or 70.9 plus 40. So then that's. Grams calcium chloride over one mole of calcium chloride. So, what do you guys get? Point zero zero six five three. Okay, 
So then I plug so into this equation. The I would just be three, right? That's right. Okay. I equals three. So I have delta T. Oh, there's one other thing. What, what temperature does water normally freeze at? Zero degrees. Okay. So we know that it's gonna equal zero degrees Celsius. So then if we, that delta T is gonna be equal to zero degrees minus T of solution or, okay. So then we can plug that in there for that. And so we get negative T solution equals three times 1.86 centimeters, I mean, not centimeters, Celsius over Molality times zero point zero zero six five three moles over zero point one seven five KJ. I mean KG. Um, So then I'll get T is going to equal, if I have to bring the negative over on the other side, Anyone? I messed up on the calculator. I did division instead of multiplication. I got to redo it. Point two zero eight or negative point two zero eight. Negative. Point two zero eight degrees Celsius. Why is it though like um, zero minus T solution? Because I would just think it would be the other way around. If it's final minus initial, wouldn't the final but solution it, be T solution? No, no, no. So it's not final minus initial. It's actually, it's the pure solution. It's pure minus the solution. Right, so it's the change in what a pure substance would be minus the solution. Is. Oh, okay. 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 So where where elevation is solution minus pure substance. Wait, can you say it one more time? Where uh, boiling point elevation is the opposite. It's solution minus mm -hmm. pure substance. So okay. anytime that you're adding something to it, if it's not reacting, if it's not causing a chemical reaction, you're going to increase the boiling temperature. Or if right. you're adding it and you're freezing, then you're going to decrease the uh, freezing temperature. Okay. Yeah, actually, no, I could, I could see that it would always 
to be negative then because you're going below zero. That's right. So, okay. And so you want to kind of remember that, you know, it's kind of like, oh, so like ice cream, ice cream really, it takes a lot to get ice cream to go below freezing because it has the milk and everything in the, in the water, you know, mm -hmm. has all the proteins and stuff in there. So. Right. Yeah, I think my brain's just been hardwired to see delta as final minus initial. Yeah. You got to be flexible. Okay. Uh, questions, concerns, Cash? Cool. Okay. Now, we're going to do something really hard now. I'm going to look at a, oops, a screen full of words. Okay. So, at this point, we've talked about solutions, right? And so, the difference between solutions, um, and now I'm going to introduce you to uh, colloids, and I'm going to introduce you to um, suspensions. Okay, so a solution is the particles are basically going to be evenly dispersed. It's going to be dissolved in what the solutes are going to basically be dissolved in the solvent. Okay, so that is the definition of a solution: is the fact that you're able to sit there and get things dissolved in there. And the reason that you're able to get things dissolved is basically based upon particle size. Colloids or colloidal uh, dispersion is basically you're using larger particle size that are going to be dissolved in, um, of uh, dissolvable um, solutes in solution. So like um, if you guys, have any of you guys made gravy before? None of you guys made homemade gravy? Or pudding, homemade pudding? Yeah. Okay. So if you ever make homemade gravy or homemade pudding, you use flour to sit there and do it, right? It's to thicken your, your mixture. So you use your milk, your flour, and stuff like that. If you put your flour in before it's cold and you don't disperse your flour evenly, what happens is you get these little aggregates, you get these little balls. Uh, flour that kind of stick together and uh but that it floats and it goes throughout your entire solution of gravy right so that's an example of a, a colloid right so that would be a colloid because it's distributed through the process through the entire thing but you have those little clumps of flour through it does that make sense yes so um, so because you're you're getting those those aggregates, right? And uh, so that aggregation of those particles together, that's going to be like a colloid, but they're able again to be dispersed throughout that solution. So that would be a colloid. Uh, immersions or like um, immersion agents. So those are examples of colloids. Milk is basically a colloid because if you actually take a look at it, it's, it's actually large particles of proteins that are aggregating in, uh, in a solution. But it's gonna be dispersed throughout as long as you have like that fat to help you keep it in solution, right? Uh, soaps basically acts like uh, <clears throat> Uh, colloid when they're reacting with animal fats. <clears throat> so are colloids like related to um, emulsifiers? Yes. Is it always the same thing? Yes, pretty much. Oh, okay. Yep. <clears throat> um, so a suspension is basically it's a uh, heterologous mixture with aggregates that are larger than the colloids. And so what happens is they have the potential of dropping out a solution. So like for instance, dirt. If you guys ever put dirt in solution, like you shake it all up and everything like that and let it sit. And then you have parts of it that stays in solution, but eventually parts of it starts dropping out. Okay. And that's pretty much it. Questions? Concerns? Cash? Credit? 
So have you guys ever played with Orbeez? Yeah. Okay. Yes. So they're, they're things that absorb water, right? So in that case, you have water and you have the Orbe. So is that going to be a solution? Is it going to be a colloid or is it going to be a suspension? Suspension? It's going to be a suspension. Okay, what about how many of you guys work out and use the wheat protein or soy protein? You shake it in the bottle. So is that one a colloid? Is it a suspension or is it a solution? Colloid. Colloid. Okay. What about uh magnesium sulfate or epsom salt when i put in the bath is that going to be a solution a colloid or a suspension solution a solution okay piece cake what about kool-aid Also a solution, right? Yep, also a solution. So like a colloid would be when it gets, um, oh, I can't remember the word and you just said it, but when you can see the visible, the visible particles in it. Yeah. And then how would you know when it goes from a colloid to a suspension? Uh, if it falls out of solution. In other words, it's big enough. It's big enough. It can be in solution, but it starts to fall out. It starts to fall out. And it's heterologous. In other words, it's it's not it's not homologous so that everything is exactly the same. You have like like salt and water. I mean not salt, pepper and water, right? So it doesn't all become clear. It's you can actually see the, the fragments of pepper in it. Right. Okay. Makes sense? Yes, no, maybe? Yes, for the yeah. most part. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's it for today. So I'll see you guys on Wednesday. Have a good night, Dr. Henry. See your egg. Oh, yeah. Oh, was that three or four of them? Three. Three. Okay. Yep. Bye. Okay. Bye bye. Do we have that after today, Dr. Henner? Yeah. You're doing your eggs. You're preparing your eggs. That's it. So you got to put so eggs in your bag. What was that? You don't have to do it online. Online. Right? We're not doing it online, so. So you're just gonna, cause all you're gonna do is literally stick eggs in vinegar and that's it. No, so, no, I know. I thought that was an online simulation. Oh yeah, yeah. Lab so yeah, there is gonna be an online lab, but it's not gonna go up yet. It's gonna go up a little bit later. I have to, I have to get it uploaded and uh, and active. So, cause it's not oh. uh, already active. So. Okay. Thank you, Doctor. Okay. Yeah. Good night. Wednesday. I'll see you on Wednesday. Have a good night.